I want you to take your Bibles in hand now and turn with me to Revelations chapter 4. Revelations chapter 4. And uh, as you're turning to that passage, I, I just want to echo what Keith and Mark has said this morning to you, Sam. Just, it's good to see you this, see this morning. And uh, it's so good to see Maverick this morning, too. And uh, God's Word talks about that, that children are a blessing from the Lord. And so we're so glad that you're blessed with this newborn. Sam, and uh, blessing that to Jasper as well, too. Good to see you this morning. Revelation chapter 4, and we're going to be reading this whole chapter, and I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here. And I'll show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelin around the throne. It was a rainbow that had the appearance of an em- emerald. Around the throne were 24, el- 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments, with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and pearls of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne on each side of the throne are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second like creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight, and the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And whenever whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. May the Lord bless the reading of this word. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these words that you had the Apostle John write to give us a glimpse of what it will be like in heaven someday when you finally call us home to heaven. Lord, we thank you for these words, Lord, and now as we study them, may you open our eyes to see you, open our ears to hear from you, and give us the courage to put into practice what you teach us this morning. For these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, we continue our series called The Escape Plan. And today we're looking at Revelation 4 and and a picture that we see in heaven. A picture that we all as a church will see in heaven someday. And I'm so excited for that day when we get to stand before God and see this picture that we see here in Revelation 4. Uh, It's going to be something really neat to see. Um, People have sometimes tried to depict this scene of Revelation 4. and, And here's one picture Oh, before we get to that, again, here's the, our little um, order of events of what's going on. We're not saying timeline because we don't know when these things are going to take place. And some of these things overlap a little bit in eschatology a bit. But here we are here now 
looking at the throne of, of heaven. Uh, we've talked before our vacation time of these th- three things, things that are unordered events. We don't know when they're going to take place, uh, but we know that they're going to take place at some point between now and at the end of the tribulation. Um, we think that some of these things are going to take place before the tribulation starts, but we don't know for sure when they're going to take place. Um, so again, we're here in the throne room. This actually does take place after the rapture. So the rapture of the church takes place, and we're all, those of us who are Christians are in heaven before the throne of God, and we get to see this picture that we see here in Revelations, 20, in Revelations 4. And again, artists have tried to depict what this scene might look like in heaven. So here's a couple pictures. Here's one that uh, one person had drawn up what they thought would, this scene might look like. We see in here we have the, the 24 elders. We see the, the, it's not very good on the screen here, obviously, but uh, the four creatures are on the throne. And then the throne is kind of wetted out because of all how bright it is, kind of, kind of depe- depicting the glory of God. Here's another picture of that same kind of picture, except it adds kind of some other people behind the 24 elders. A th- a thing, I'm assuming that that's supposed to be the early, that's supposed to be the church there. Maybe it's angels, but uh, God's word is talk about how we, when we're in heaven, will be granted these nice, bright, white robes when we stand before God too. So uh, some people try to depict things. They have a picture of what it's going to look like. And, and I do this, show these two pictures for two reasons. One, kind of to um, get our creative juices in our minds going and kind of imagine what it might look like in heaven someday. Um, but also to remind us though too, we don't know what it's going to look like for sure. This scene is described here, but to, to actually see it is going to be something amazing. I don't know about you, but I'm excited for that day when we get to stand before God and see this situation happening. To see Jesus on the throne and these four creatures and the 24 elders and the whole church around God celebrating and worshiping God together. We need to understand some of this scene and that it will take place in heaven. Because it gives us an idea of some of what we'll be doing before God. Now, I don't think it's necessarily beginning in eternal, uh, like a worship service like this, all the time. But it's probably going to be more going on in heaven. We don't know all we'll be doing, but one of the things we know, we will we'll be worshiping God. And actually to be before God's face and to be able to live still will be an amazing thing. So there's three things we're going to look at this morning on this passage. The first is this. There is one seated on the throne. There is one seated on the throne. Again, verse 1 through verse 6 says this. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, saying, Come up here, and I'll show you what must take place after this. <coughs> Apostle John here is being called up by an angel to see what is about to take place. I'm kind of remember of a scene from a movie called Three Amigos. You might remember it. A scene where, um, oh, I forget his name, the blonde guy. <laughs> Steve Martin, there we go. He goes up to the top of the wall because they're, the Three Amigos are going to try to go into this, into this house to try to save this person. And he gets up there because he's looked to make sure it's okay and he's on top of the wall now. And the other two amigos are down below. Chevy Chase and um, Martin... Martin Short. I should remember that because he is short, isn't he? <laughs> and it's, it's kind of a neat scene. He's, he's trying to get their attention without getting their attention. He goes, it doesn't make the sound of a bird. Hey! Look! Up here! Up here! In that whole scene, they don't get the clue that they're being called. Well, it's not quite like that, but there's this angel speaking to John, and John takes notice when he hears the angel saying, actually, we believe that it's Jesus. He says, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. So here, Jesus is starting to give John the vision of what's going to take place in the latter days. 
This is going to take place again after the rapture of the church when we're called home to heaven. And so John writes these words to remind us of what Jesus is going to do. Verse 2 now. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, and one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments, with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and pearls of thunder, and before the throne were seven burning torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. There's a lot in this scene here, isn't there? In these first six verses. It says here again in, in, in verse... Uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, verse 2. Um, after he's called up by Jesus to see what's about to take place, instantly John is in the Spirit. So it's not that he's actually there, but he's having this vision that Jesus has given him of what it's going to be like someday in heaven, at least for a part of the time in heaven. So he starts to look at this vision. And there's some significant things here. Arnold Frutenbaum says this about the scene. The invitation to John is not a symbol of the rapture, for as we will be shown shortly, the church is viewed as being already in heaven. So I've said this already, and Arnold Frutenbaum also believes that's the case. But he also says further, in verse 1 with the phrase, after these things, John introduces events which will chronologically follow the previous context, namely the seven churches. The events of Revelation 4 and 5 then chronologically follow the events of the seven churches. We haven't looked at the seven churches in the beginning of Revelation here, the first three chapters. Um, I did a sermon series of that in, in another church, and maybe we'll go to that sometime in the future too, um, because it is pertinent to today still too. Uh, the seven different churches, and with some of them, God kind of gives them a bit of a scolding, and with some of them, he gives them a blessing. Uh, but all of them, he's calling them to focus on him still because the end is near. So once John is in the Spirit, and verse 3 talks about how there's one who sat in the, as the parents of Jasper and Carnelin. I don't know what Carnelin is. I haven't looked that up. But Jasper, we, we know that it's a, a, kind of like an emerald in a way. It's, it's a greenish type of gem, a very, very precious gem. We have a boy here named Jasper in our church here, don't we? And I remember one Sunday, uh, quite some time ago, we we're talking about names, what they mean. And I had mentioned to Jasper that his name means a precious treasure because a Jasper stone is a precious, precious stone. And in heaven, Jesus is going to have the appearance of Jasper as he sits on the throne. Again, speaking that Jesus has a great value actually far more than the Jasper stone that we know today. Or this Carlin, Carlin stone too. Uh, something very precious. And Jesus is far more precious. But also the beauty of it is, is so profound that it exudes light from Christ as well. In fact, actually, this is a scene that really no words can really describe it. We've seen two pictures to kind of des describe it in some ways, but still doesn't do enough to tell us and to show us how beautiful it's going to be to see Jesus on his throne. But this stone of Jasper and Carlin does speak to something about Jesus, about his purity. We have sung a couple of songs this morning that mentions about the holiness of God. And there's nothing that we can imagine or even see now before we get to heaven that can show the glory of God because of how holy he is. God's word often describes Jesus as pure light in some ways. 
because he is so pure and so holy. So this scene of Jesus being on the throne is speaking to God's holiness and how pure Jesus is. Then in verse 4, it talks about how around the throne of God is 12 thrones as well. And on each seat is one of the elders. We'll be talking about that further, what this means in a moment. Then verse 5, from the throne comes flashes of lightning and rumblings and pearls of thunder. And before the throne are these seven burning torches. And God's Word actually interprets that for us right off the bat here. And tells us it's the seven spirits of God. I wonder what this will look like when we stand before God. To see these rumblings and lightnings coming from the throne. I don't know about you, but I actually really love thunderstorms. I know I've talked about this a couple times before, but I, I love thunderstorms. We had a thunderstorm not too long ago in the last few weeks. I can't remember which day it was, but I remember I was asleep, and all of a sudden I was woken up because I heard this big rumble of thunder. It wasn't the biggest thunder I've heard before, but, but have you ever had those little thunders that rumble so, so big that you can feel the whole house shake? I love those thunders. It reminds me of God's power. And yet God's power is far greater than that thunder or the lightning that we see. But those are symbols as this thunder rolls in heaven and these lightnings come from the throne of God that remind us that God too is all powerful. Then verse 6. Before the throne was a sea of glass like crystal. This appears in this prophetic vision of God's throne room. And actually speaks of the floor of, of heaven. We, as we've seen in the past, as we look at God's word, heaven is described as having streets paved with gold. But the gold is so pure that it's translucent. Imagine that, seeing gold that that pure, that you could see through it. We have gold today that uh, maybe some of us have rings on our fingers or maybe watches that have gold on it. And we look at it and it may be beautiful. Maybe you have 10 karat or 14 karat gold on you. But imagine seeing that and seeing it being translucent. You could see through it. That's how pure the streets of gold are. And, and this verse here too speaks of, of how the floor of heaven is so pure because it actually reminds us too of the purity of God, that God is holy. So as we look at these first six verses, what, what is in it for us then? Because uh, this is more of a scene that there's really not a special lesson here other than knowing something about God and something about what's going to take place in the future. The thing we can learn from this is a point of action that we can worship God for His brilliance. Whenever we sing praises and however we worship God, because remember worship is more than singing songs, but in all the ways we worship God, to remember the brilliance and the purity of God. That God is holy. When we sing songs of praise, as we sung this morning too, each word that we sing, we're focusing on God. Because remember, worship is about God. In our prayer time before worship this morning, um, I had prayed that, Lord, may we remember that this is about you. It's not about us. It is all about God. Sometimes we as Christians forget that the worship service and anything that, we, that has to do with worshiping God is, is about God and not about us. Sometimes we don't like certain songs, but it's not about us and what we like. It's about God. So we must focus on God and worship Him because of His brilliance. As we sing a song singing each word in praise to the Lord. As we pray together, this morning we had Mark lead us in prayer, praying along with the person who's praying out loud and worshiping God for each word we lifted to the Lord, the one God who can hear those prayers. When we take partake of communion together, worshiping God and giving thanks for his sacrifice on the cross for our sins. 
We don't have this part of our worship gathering time, but even given our tithes and offerings, whether you put it in the black box at the back or whether you do it by e-transfer. <coughs> Giving our tithes and offerings to the Lord, too, is a great act of worship. So when we give our tithes to the, and offerings to the Lord, giving praise to Him, and remembering that we are giving to Him a portion of what have you, He has entrusted to us, and remembering that reliance upon God for all things. Even when we take that first step out of bed in the morning, may that be an act of worship and remembering that God is giving you that day to set foot on this earth before he calls you home to heaven. And even in the here and now, being thankful for the time we have now and giving praise to the Lord in each moment of each day because God is holy. And because God loves us dearly. Second point we see here that speaks of the four living creatures. And we see this from verse 7 through 9. Actually, midway through verse 6. It starts and says this, And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes front and behind. The first living creature, like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, and the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight, and the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say. Now stop there for a moment. Imagine this when we're standing before the throne in heaven and see these four creatures. Man, I don't think there's a person alive who could have the creative mind to come up with creatures like this. Mankind has been pretty creative with a lot of different ideas of creatures that they have drawn or, uh, or made into movies about. But when I see this scene and see this and hear this, man, the imagination that God had to create these creatures, full of eyes, front and back, all over their body, can you imagine that? I don't know about you, but I, m I might be a little bit freaked out by seeing this. <laughs> There's nowhere you can go for that creature, those four creatures, not to be able to see you. Talk about 3D vision, eh? <laughs> and then the description too, they all, all four of them had six wings. Have you ever seen anything depicted in a movie of something having more than two wings? I haven't seen anything like that still something weird but beautiful about it still too and then one the first creature looked like a lion but notice the words it was like a lion it wasn't a lion but it was like a lion I wonder what that really actually looks like then what John actually seen to see this creature that looked like a lion but what's the lion? Another creature looked like an ox. It wasn't an ox, but looked kind of like an ox. Then one that had a face of a man. Man, I wonder what the rest of the body looked like on that. Was it actually a man or that had all these eyes and these wings or, or was it something else but the face of a man? Kind of weird still. And then the fourth one it was like an eagle in flight. I couldn't imagine what that would be too. Like, like an eagle. Well, what's the whole point of these four creatures? Why would God create something so bizarre? It's because of these next words that we see in verse 8. These all important words that they are saying all the time around the throne of God. Again, here's the words. Holy Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Notice in this verse, verse 2, just a little bit before these words, it mentions that they're around and within and day and night they're saying these words. They don't stop saying it. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And they're saying this over and over and over again. They never cease to stop saying it. Might seem kind of monotonous, but yet 
to say those words before God all the time because he is that holy to have these four creatures say it over and over and over again. You've heard me say this before. Whenever God's word says something and repeats it a, a few times, it's pretty significant and important. And that's very significant here because there's no word in this world that can describe how holy God is. That's why it's repeated three times here. God is that holy. He's that amazing. And yet, such a holy God still would choose to die in our place for our sin. I don't know about you, but it shows the great love of God to be that holy and that loving all at the same time. Here's a point for us of action in this regard too. It's to bring honor and glory and thanksgiving to God. Yes, these three things are, yes, an act of worship to God still, but specifically the thing of honoring God with our words and our actions. To give glory to Him and thanksgiving. To be so thankful for all that God has blessed us with including the trials and tribulations we face because through those things, God is going to bring a blessing upon us as we persevere through them. Third thing to look at this morning is the 24 elders. The 24 elders. Verse 10 and 11, we get this picture with these. The 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, <clears throat> our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. <clears throat> we don't know exactly who these 24 elders are, but we see a couple things here. We see they're on, each of the elders are on a throne of their own. And they each have a crown too. And this is still pretty significant because they're actually in a place of honor. But what do they do? They throw their crowns before God and they bow down for him, before him and say these important words too. To show honor and glory to God. Now, we don't, again, we don't know who for sure these 24 elders, and there's a couple of possibilities. One, some believe that these 24 elders are, are angels. There's some scholars who have believed that it's angels. But that doesn't seem, seem to fit because nowhere in Scripture do we see angels referred to as elders. Elders is something we see that that's are a group of leaders Either in Israel, as we see in the Old Testament, or in the New Testament, we see in the church. So it probably makes more sense that these 24 elders are people. Now, who are they, though? Well, some scholars talk about, too, that maybe it's 12 elders of Israel and the 12 apostles that are the 24 elders. Because the, the 12 apostles were elders in the church. So maybe it's them. So we don't know for sure who these 24 elders, but I think what makes most sense is that it's 12 elders from Israel and 12 elders from the church. To me, that makes sense. I could be wrong on that. I'll be open with that part. I could be wrong, but that's what I think. Either way, it doesn't matter what we think about this. The, the, the point here is that these, these 24 elders are here and they bring honor and glory to God, even though, again, they're put in a place of honor. It mentions here, too, that these elders are clothed in white garments. The significance, too, speaking of the purity of these elders, because God has made them pure.
Now for the crowns. The crowns is important parts to this too. There's a few different crowns, and when we talk, I think we talked about crowns before in the past sermon. We talked about the rewards that we have in heaven for us. There's two possibilities of crowns for what's mentioned here for these crowns. One could be the diadem crown, or the Stephanos crown. And some scholars believe that it has to be the, the Stephanos crown because the diadem crown seems to be the one that fits Christ most. So that's the crown that Christ has. Because again, it speaks of authority and of power. And Christ has power over all people. So it stems reason that it's the Stephanos crown, which is still a place of honor. And these elders, they take these crowns off and they put them before Jesus, who sits on the throne. Pretty significant symbol and action. If you look through history, how many times have we seen kings come before other kings and lay their crowns before those other kings? Not too often, is there? Or at least willingly. Usually those crowns would have to be taken by, by force through war, usually. But these elders willingly bow before Jesus and lay the crowns before him. Which shows again the importance of showing honor to God. And again the important words that the elders say. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Those see these last few words. And by your will, they existed and were created. By God's will. Did you know it was God's will for you to be created? It's pretty significant right there, isn't it? Because God created you for a relationship with Him. Did you know that the grass in the field is significant? Because it speaks of the detail that God has. Creativity and how awesome God is. Or the night sky when we look at it and all the stars that we see. Um, there's a new telescope that was put out in space um, not too long ago, several months ago. And I can't remember the name of the telescope, but it's in the... Thank you, James Webb Telescope. And I don't know if you've seen any of the pictures from there yet. Some of you are nodding your head, yes. But some of the pictures coming back are, are amazing to see what's in and out in space there. And all of that is still, it says here, God willed to create these things and they're significant. And they're all significant again because it points to God. It baffles me how people can look at this world and say, there is no God. It baffles me. I know we have the old argument, the watchmaker one, where there, because all of this is here, something had to create it. it had, there had to be a start to it. And actually, atheists agree that there's a start to all of this, but they try to take God out of the equation. There's many scientists, even scientists who aren't Christian, who look at this world and this universe and life and our bodies, and they look and say, you know what, this looks designed. It's because it is designed. All things got created. He created to again give a witness of himself to point that he exists. So then find out who is this God who loves us dearly. Again, these wonderful words. Worthy are you, our, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. And then again, these elders give the reasons why. God is awesome. God is all-powerful. You know, God doesn't need us or any of this in this universe. But he still chose to create it and to create us for relationship with him. Truly this speaks of how awesome God is. And should bring us to this point of action to fall before God in worship. May we be like those 24 elders at times too, to fall before God, even on our face, on the floor, because of how holy and awesome God is to worship Him. Remember there's a hymn that's, there's a line in it that talks about us falling prostrate before God. You know what prostrate means? 
to get as low as we can to the ground, to be on our face in the ground. That's a humbling place to be, isn't it? But to be in that place sometimes to remember how awesome God is, to bring glory to Him. Or maybe it's in worship. You know, there's some songs that sometimes the lyrics and songs we have talk about sometimes falling to our knees. How often do we do that? Or any worship song that we sing that there's an instruction that we talk about. For instance, we sang this morning, we will dance on the streets that are golden. I'm not saying that all of us need to be dancers and dancing before the Lord in worship, but we can. And maybe if you want to worship in God through dancing, you should then. Or maybe it's clapping hands or being quiet and just listening to the words. Either way, we are to worship God. You know what worship means? It means to kiss the hand of. So we must do that. Kiss the hand of God to worship Him. This passage is significant this morning. It doesn't give us any instructions, really, other than to look at something for us to remind us to do, to bring glory to God, to worship God, the Spirit and in truth. But especially teaches us of what's going to take place in heaven. Gives us a little glimpse of what to be excited about when we stand before God. But until then, may we worship God in all that we do and say to bring honor and glory to Him. You can know Jesus. If you are a person who does not know Jesus, know that he loves you and created you with significance. Because he wants to have a relationship with you. That's why he died on the cross for your sins. So if you're listening to this and you're not yet a Christian, I invite you to come and talk with me after or if you're watching it online to contact me through our contact page by email or by phone. So let them look, share further the gospel of how much Jesus loves you why he died for you on the cross for your sins. Do you want to be able to see this scene in heaven someday? Then surrender your life to him. Live your life fully for him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for these words this morning that remind us of what's going to take place when you call us home to heaven. Lord, I so look forward to this day to stand to see these four really weird creatures surrounding you and your throne. These 24 elders giving praise and glory to you and to be a part of your church before you and giving praise and glory and honor to you. Lord God, but may we not wait till we get to heaven to give honor to you. <clears throat> may we even now give honor and glory to you in all that we do and say. Lord, as we spend time in your word to grow, as we live out our lives for you, may it be all for your glory to show how great and awesome you are again too. God, you are a good God. And so Lord, we choose to surrender ourselves to you. For these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.